Hi there, my name is David Kenny. Welcome to our program, Light From Above. Glad you could be with us today. We're broadcasting from beautiful Wadsworth, Ohio, and glad you can be a part of the program today. We're doing a series of lessons about the New Testament church, and in this series of lessons, we're talking about the church in portrait. And basically, a portrait is a picture, uh, a metaphor, if you will, and there's several pictures about the New Testament church that's given in the scriptures that we want to make sure that we take a look at. And that term that we're going to look at today is soma. Soma. Now, last time we looked at the term ecclesia, the called out ones. Well, this one is another important picture, portrait, if you will, of the New Testament church. Now, we'll give you sort of a preview of our lesson here. We're going to talk about the definition. What does soma mean? And then we'll talk about one head, one body, and many members. Now, when we look at the definition of the term soma, if you look at a Greek lexicon, and I have an example one here for you, the term soma appears 146 times in the King James Version. 144 times the word is translated body. So, you know, we, we know what the term soma means. It is talking about a body. The New Testament church is a body. So, it, there's a lot of great parallels that we can draw from this idea that the church is a body. Just like, you know, we have a body, and this is the imagery that you're going to find in the New Testament. For example, the Apostle Paul wrote in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18, he said, And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. Now this passage clearly shows that Jesus is the head of the body, that the body is the church. Now when people sit, when they sit themselves down and they make themselves heads of churches and things like that, that's something they should not be doing. It's very important, and people come up with all kinds of ways of, of doing that. For example, some people will say that, well, Christ is the head of the church in heaven, but this person, or maybe this committee, or this group of people, they're the church here, they're the head of the church here on earth. But you have to be very careful about that. That's, you know, that's really going against what the scriptures teach. We are part of the body. Christ is the head of the church. And any time that we you know, impose ourselves into that kind of idea that we're the head, we're really running against the idea of what a New Testament church is about. Well, let's take a look at another passage. This is in Ephesians chapter 1, 22 through 23. Paul would also write the same thing to the church at Ephesus. And he wrote and said, And he put all things under his feet, and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Now notice that you know, he, it, it, the church is his body. It's, it's the fullness of it. And he's the head over it. Now, it, when you think about your body, your physical body, how many heads do you have? Well, people are like, well, that, that may, that's easy. I only have one. You know, that, I mean, people they laugh at the silliness of a question like that. But you need to understand the New Testament church de is depicted in the New Testament as the body, and Christ is the head. And that's something that people just, they, they, for whatever reason, they understand it when they look at themselves in the mirror, but when they look in the New Testament and look at the churches that they're a part of, and they have earthly headquarters, or they have uh, these other agencies, they say, well, we're in charge of the church. Well, they're making themselves another head. And that's something that they cannot do. That is, if they're not going to be a part of the New Testament church. Now, if you're going to give up the New Testament, well, then that's a different matter. But we're not talking about that. We're talking about being the church of the New Testament, being a part of the body of Christ. If you want to have him as your head, don't accept substitutes. Don't do that. The New Testament is very plain about this. Let's look at Ephesians 5 and verse 24. Paul wrote here, it says, Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let wives be to their own husbands in everything. You know, there's, there's role designations here. You know, God, you know, he created a family, and he created the role differences between husbands and wives. Well, the same is true of the church. The church is subject to Christ. You know, that term subject, some people, you know, they sort of wince at that in this politically charged, correct day and age we have. But you need to understand that, you know, ideas of subjection, submission, things like that, 
If you look back into what that word means, it's talking about a military uh, array, an arrangement. You know, generals and corporals and lieutenants and ranks and things like that. They're arrayed together. They're organized. Everyone has a role. Each plays that role. Everybody's important. Each has a vital purpose in that. Well, the same is true when it comes to matters of religion. Jesus is the head of the church. He, we take all our directions from him and, and nobody else. I mean, that's really important. A lot of people, they really miss this point. And it's something that you know, churches of Christ have been pointing out to people for centuries, decades, that you know, we take our directions in matters of theology from Jesus. Well, where are those directions at? Well, they're in his word, in the New Testament. And any time that you're a part of an organization that, you know, even though their intentions may be good, and you're going to have to make a determination, you're going to have to study and look at the organization you're a part of, and you're going to have to make the determination, is, the, is this group that I'm worshiping with, are they really following Christ? Now, they may say his word, they may have pictures painted of him, of course, we don't know what he looked like, and they may have all kinds of icons, and they may have all kinds of, you know, great services, and they may be, but, you know, ask yourself, is this really the church as it is explained in the New Testament? If it's not, you need to make a change. You really do. The church only has one head, and that head is Christ. In 2 John chapter 1 and verse 9, the apostle John wrote, whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. Now, the idea of doctrine, some people, you know, they, they really get caught up with that word. Some people have a real hang up with that idea of doctrine. Well, what does the word doctrine mean? Well, the word doctrine means the teaching, the teaching of Christ. You know, every once in a while, I'll hear someone say, you know, when they're talking about Bible classes or worship services, and maybe they're just not happy with things, and, and they'll say something like, you know, this Bible class, we have way too much doctrine. We have too much doctrine. Let's talk about the Bible, or let's talk about this or that, or whatever they want to talk about. But, you know, they, you know what they explain to you, even though they don't realize it, they haven't looked up the definition of the word doctrine. Doctrine means teaching. That's what it means. And so, as a New Testament church, we follow the teaching of Christ. We abide in it. We don't go outside of it or around it, we are working through it, with it. We are abiding in that doctrine. If we want to have the blessings of Christ, we had better do that. It's amazing to me that some people in our day, they think, <laughs> I don't know where they get this thought, they think they could do whatever they want. They, you know, they, they, say, they basically have this idea. They may not put it this way, but their actions and their, some of the things they say, they hold to this view. God should just be thankful that I showed up to worship him. It is such a burden on me to go to church, to go to assemble with people and worship. And he should be thankful that I even showed up. Or he should be grateful that whatever I'm willing to bring, he should accept. Now ask yourself, you know, is that our attitude about it? I mean, God has laid out great blessings for us. Jesus has you know, sacrificed his life. He sacrificed his well-being. He did all that so that we could have salvation. And he tells us what we need to do to be pleasing to him. It's not like we have to guess. He tells us. Now the question is, are you going to follow it? I mean, really, think about that. You know, this idea that, you know, well, we can just sacrifice whatever we want. We can just, you know, when we go to church, when we go to worship, when we go, you know, people say, well, I just didn't get anything out of it. I just didn't get anything out of it at all. They need to realize something. When you go to worship God, you're the one that's giving. You're the one that's giving. When you go there, you are giving God your recognition, your adoration, and your praise of him. It isn't a matter of taking. Now, it is true that when we go and we are involved in a worship service that we 
hopefully, you know, we should feel better or we should be challenged to live better lives. And think, I mean, all that's true. But sometimes people get this mixed up. They think that when I go to church, somebody say, I'll go to church or I go to worship, it's about what I'm going to get out of it. But, you know, there's too many people that are takers. Worship is giving. It's giving. We give our sacrifices of praise and adoration to Jesus, to the Father, the Holy Spirit. We give those things to the head of the church. If we do that, if we want to be pleasing, we better follow the directions of the head, Christ being the head. Well, let's look in Ephesians 4, 15 through 16. Paul would write, But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Now, some, you know, some fail to realize that when, the, you know, when they don't do everything they're supposed to do for the church, the body suffers. And that's something that people really need to keep in mind. We're not all the same. I mean, we have a lot of similarities and all that, but you know, you're not the same as I am. I'm not the same as you are. We, we all have skills. Um, I remember when I was applying for government jobs at one point in time, I always had to write these KSAs. It drove me crazy. KSAs, knowledge, skills, and abilities. And you had to detail them out for these applications. I can't remember what the application was called. And it, you know, that's, that's what they wanted you to fill out. We, know, we all have different, if you will, KSAs, knowledge, skills, and ability. We all have things we can do. Now, we're all different from one another. But, you know, our bodies are like that. Our bodies are like that. You know, the eye is not the same as the hand. The hand is not the same as the ear. The elbow is not the same as the foot. You know, that imagery is there. That picture is there. We are all important to God. We all have a vital part of the body. If you don't be a part of that, the body suffers from it. It doesn't operate the best that it could. So that's important that we keep in mind. Now, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 16, the Apostle Paul wrote that there is one body. He says, and, he, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. Now, here's something that you know, you've got to keep in mind. It's one body. Now, if the body is the church, and it is, and there's only one of them, and there is, that's pleasing to God, what about, you know, in our day and age, we have all these churches. Now, I'm not talking about uh, the church in this town and that town and maybe in this county. I'm not talking about the same kind of church in different locations. No, I'm talking about the same general location, but all these different religious groups. You know, when you look at denominationalism, denominationalism is the idea that we're all part of a whole. You know, we're all different, but, you know, really, we're all part of that one body. But, you see, that doesn't work. That doesn't work. There is one church. There is one body. We, as individuals, are different, and we make up that body but to change that, to morph it to a situation where you say all these different denominations are all part of the one body is incorrect. It's incorrect. And that's something that we need to give serious thought to. It's interesting that Paul would have to point out that there is one body on more than one occasion. Let's look at what he wrote in Ephesians 4, 4 through 5. He says, There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called, and one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. I could point out the fact that there's one baptism. You know, people try to tell you, well, you know, you could be baptized by sprinkling, by pouring, or by immersion. But you can't. Baptism is immersion. That's what the word means. And so people just ignore that. Well, a lot of people do that with religious organizations too. They want to just change it. They say, well, we are recognize that there's one church and that's one body and they ought to be the same. But, you know, we're just going to sidestep that and we're going to do whatever we want to do. And we're going to remove ourselves from the New Testament. And God will be accepted of that. He'll be pleased with that. I mean, I understand what the New Testament says, 
But, you know, is he really going to care? You better believe he's going to care. He's definitely going to care. I don't understand how people can go through our land, through our day, and say that God gave us the Bible and doesn't expect us to read it or follow it. That's just, I don't understand how people can do that. And sadly, there's going to be a rude awakening for them. So we'd be better off to prepare. Now on our next point, we're going to talk about the idea of many members. Now this is a longer reading. This is from 1 Corinthians chapter 12. So you'll have to follow along with the multiple slides that we'll look at here. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, um, excuse me, 12 through 20. It says here that, For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether Jew or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one body. For in the fact the body is not one member but many. If the foot should say, Because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If an ear should say, because I am not an eye, I am not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? And if the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body, just as he pleased. And if we were all one member, where would the body be? But now indeed there are many members, yet one body. Now notice that Christ mentioned, you know, He's, we're part of that body, and we're baptized into that body. All members are important. All members of the church are important, but they're not the same. They're not the same. It saddens me when, you know, I, I find someone that has become discouraged because they just don't feel like they're a part of the church anymore. That's really sad. It's really sad. There's a lot of things that can be done, and the leadership of congregations would do well to look out for those people and try to involve them in the work. It may take some time to find opportunities to work with other people or maybe, you know, things like mowing the grass, taking out the trash, cleaning the building, preparing communion. All those things are very important. They're all very important. Some people think, well, I, I can't preach, but you can write or you can talk to others. You can invite people to church. You could write letters to the editor. You can help take care of the grounds. There are all kinds of things that are vital that need to be done. I mean, just think about it. If everybody was a preacher in a congregation, who's going to preach? How's that going to work? Some people are going to have to listen. I mean, it's just a part of it. And you know, we think about that, and you know, there's many members of that body. There's many members of the church, and they're all vitally important. They're all important. We should never be in a position where we're mocking or deriding or minimizing you know, another member of the church. Maybe they don't do something the same way that we do it. Well, you know, we need to watch that. You might be the one with the bigger problem than them. It's very important that we realize the value that each member of the church has. We need to make sure that those members of the church are being fully utilized. That they have the opportunity to serve, to serve God the same that we seek to serve Him as well. Well, let's, you know, let's go on. In 1 Corinthians chapter 21, uh, excuse me, chapter 12, 21 through 23, it says, And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No, much rather, those members of the church which seem to be weaker are necessary, and those members of the body which they think to be less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor. And our unpresentable parts have greater modesty. Now, again, you know, members of the body which seem to be weaker, they're necessary. If you feel, you know, as a part of the church, if you feel inferior or things like that, you, know, you need to realize that God doesn't look at you that way. God doesn't look at you that way. Sometimes we get caught up in the way other people look at us. And it, it could be a real challenge. But we need to remember that, you know, we are valuable to God. God cares about us. Jesus came to this earth to lay his life down for all. For all. 
don't ever put yourself in a situation mentally where you think, I am substandard. You know, God created you. Jesus sacrificed himself for you. Established the church so you could be a part of it. God doesn't look at you as substandard. God doesn't look at you as worthless or as junk or not vital or something that he's not, someone he's not interested in. That's not the case at all. All members, all people are important to God. Well, let's go on. You know, notice it states that the, God has composed the body. God made us. He doesn't make junk. He, Paul reminds them that all members are made in God's image and should care for one another. To avoid schisms and division, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 24 through 25, it says, But our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body, having given greater honor to that part which lacks it, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. So every person is important. And members of the church need to realize that other members are important. And we should be encouraging one another, caring about one another. Sadly, sometimes that might be lacking. It's interesting, I can remember my dad talking about, you know, whenever you're hammering and if you, you know, if you ever miss and you hit that thumb with that hammer, and, you know, that pain signal goes and that, you know, your whole body reacts to it. You know, how can I protect it? How can I take, how can I take care of it? You know, I've, I've, you know, there's a pain. It's, there's harm. Well, that's true of the church. People should be attentive to one another for their challenges. We should weep when they weep. We should be joyful when there is joy to be had. We need to be attentive to one another, appreciative of one another, aware of one another. That's something that's a part of being the body. You know, if you neglect a part of your physical body, you're going to feel it. The rest of your body will let you know. And that's important that we need to remember. Well, let's review as we close up the lesson. The word soma, what does it word it mean? It means a body. It's used of a physical body, but metaphorically it talks about the relationship between Christ and his church and Christ and various members of the church and members uh, to each other. The idea of one body. Christ is the head of the church. There's only one. He, he's it. And any organization that tries to trump that is really violating the scriptures. And then also the idea of one body. There's one church, the New Testament church. That's it. All these other religious, competing religious groups if they're not following the New Testament church, they're not the one church, they're not the one body. And that's something that, you know, maybe you've come to the realization of that. And we're not saying this to be mean or uncaring or unsympathetic or, I mean, it, quite the contrary. We're very concerned about people. We're concerned about everyone, not just uh, what some people call the unchurched. I guess that's a, that's a term that's popular, the unchurched, people who don't go to any church. Well. We're concerned about those people, but we're concerned about people that are a part of organizations that are not the New Testament church. That's important that you need to take a look at. What does the New Testament church look like? And the idea of many members. You know, we, we each have our individual parts to play. We're all a part of the great organization of the church. We're all vitally important uh, to, as a part of that body. And we always need to keep in mind as we close up the idea of one head. Christ is that one head. We take the directions. Our bodies take the directions from our head, from our mind. It's so vitally important if the body is going to do what it needs to do. The same is true of the church. We have to take our directions from that one head. And that one head is Christ. Thanks for watching our program today. Before we close our program today, we'd like to take a moment and review this roadmap to heaven with you since the matter is so serious. There are many incorrect set of directions out there and sadly so many people are following them. For example, some people have been given wrong turns. They believe things such as faith only, works only, or grace only. Or some attempt to change the order of the turns, being baptized before they even believe. Some people fail to realize what point they are on the map don't even open their Bibles yet and they think they're saved already. 
As a person travels in a car or takes a hike, it has to follow the proper directions, so we must follow the proper directions to heaven. Let's take a look at the directions on our roadmap to heaven here. You have to look at these passages in your Bible for yourself. We'll just list the steps, the turns on the way. First is to believe or to have faith. And then number two, to repent, to turn away from sin. Number three is to confess that Jesus is the Son of God. Number four is immersion or to be baptized, which is a burial in water to have your sins washed away. And then you're added to the church by the Lord, not by a group of people, or not by giving some kind of testimonial experience or things like that. And then once you're added, you need to serve and worship the Lord faithfully all the days of your life. And that, the key word's faithfully. You don't waver. And that's very important. We need to keep in mind too that in Noah's day there was a big flood and only people in the ark were saved from the flood. The same is true today. There is no salvation outside the Lord's church. Where are you on the road map to heaven? Thanks for watching our program. Please let us know if we can assist you with further information for your journey.